I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is David Drewley, the CEO of Cambridge Associates, a global investment firm that works with premier institutional investors and family offices to manage custom investment portfolios that aim to generate outperformance so they can maximize their impact on the world. David works with Cambridge's leaders to set and execute the firm's strategy, enhance its capabilities, and evolve its processes. He brings a quarter century of investment experience to the role, including a 16-year tenure at Cambridge. Our conversation covers David's path from value investing to Cambridge Associates, including a key early career lesson in calibrating risk tolerance. We discuss the history of Cambridge Associates, key characteristics of generating great investment returns, the manager selection process, and David's take on co-investments, long-only managers, hedge funds, fixed income, innovation, and future opportunities and challenges for the business. Before we get going, you can sign up at capitalallocatorspodcast.com to receive three different sources of information. Using the buttons on the homepage or the email list tab, you can receive an email from me once a month with the best things I've read and listened to over the month. While on that page, you can also sign up to receive our blog of industry news. Lastly, hop on the premium tab and subscribe to get access to the library of transcripts of podcast shows. Feel free to forward the emails you receive to friends to help spread the word. Please enjoy my conversation with David Drewley. David, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, it's great to be here. Well, let's just start at the beginning and how you got started in this business in the first place. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So when I was growing up, I was very analytical and very competitive. And in my own little world, I was really quite a basketball player. But as a six-foot person, basketball is not going to go on forever. So as I was thinking about my career as I went to the University of Texas, I really wanted something that I could lean in on the analytical part of my brain, the things that I really enjoyed doing, but something where you still got to compete. And as I came to understand the the investment world, I mean, you're competing for value add. You're competing for alpha. It's a scarce resource. So it was really a way for me to redirect my competitive spirit in a way that was natural for my brain. How would you get started? I was coming out of the University of Texas in the late 80s. It was a recession in Texas. Basically, you had an oil decline. Real estate was crashing. At the time, I didn't know. A lot of my friends were going into commercial banking. Didn't really know a path. I went to a small little regional brokerage firm down in Austin for three or four years. After that, I decided I wanted to go back to my hometown, Fort Worth, and start running money for friends, family, other private clients in the Fort Worth area. And basically set up a business where I ran value equities for private clients, which was a pretty interesting time to run value equities, especially in the late 90s. And it was really a period where the things I were doing, which was buying stocks that had dividends of 8 10% yields, buying energy stocks that were really depressed, that were trading under book value, buying stocks where you could rip the companies apart and get paid two or three times. It seemed like it was going to be pretty easy money, but as you came into 98, 99, 2000, these stocks were like generating negative returns, while the dot-coms, the technology, what was the nifty 50 of that day, were generating positive returns. It's almost like you got up every day wondering if your business was going to survive another day. The beauty of it is the clients that stayed, and most of them did, and I learned how to really explain what I was doing at that time. The clients that stayed had a tremendous run in 2000 and 2001 when everyone else was taking the pain of a significant market decline. That said, I will say one of the main lessons I learned from that time is that your risk tolerance has to be the lesser of my risk tolerance in time horizon or the asset owner's. Because what I found out at that time is we owned really cheap stocks that really ended up paying off, but some clients could not handle being out of favor for two or three years 
and ended up firing me in 99 and 2000 and just flipping and going into the stocks that just ended up being carnage in 00 and 01. So it's really not my pain threshold or time horizon. It's the lesser of mine or the client. And this is something I kind of took over as I went to work at Cambridge Associates and started working with the clients there. So just on that point, right, that period of time, Julian Robertson folds up Tiger on the same pain threshold issue. What was it in the message that you delivered that resonated for the ones that you were able to keep? The message was really consistently explaining what we were doing, what I was trying to achieve, why we thought these stocks would work out. And people inherently understand that buying cheap assets is better than buying expensive assets. You have to remind them the asset's cheap. Here's why it can stay cheap for a good while. And ultimately, it comes down to confidence that I knew what I was doing. So a lot of that confidence is built over just relationships, trust, time. You talked about Julian melting down, and that's true. And I'll never forget the day that my memory may be a little bit off on this, but again, I'm a big basketball fan. And my wife and I used to go out to Vegas to go to the sports book the first weekend of the NCAA tournament just to watch all the games. It's a phenomenal event, really. And in 2000, they had the ticker going across the bottom of the screen, which kind of is reflective of the time that it was. And I'll never forget looking up and seeing the Russell 2000 value. Again, I don't know if my memory is correct, but positive and significantly positive. I think it was up 2 3 4% while the NASDAQ was down 3 4%. And I said, that's the end. That's the end of the bubble. And it ended up being pretty close within a week or two, probably the top of the NASDAQ and started a pretty tremendous value rally at that point. So you roll forward and the clients that stay with you had a great experience from there. How did you get from there to Cambridge, which you mentioned? Yeah. So in 01, after we started to get paid back for all our hard work on the value side of things and the clients are whole, I started thinking, I really want to go and do something bigger. And I didn't know exactly what bigger meant, but I knew it meant bigger than running private client money in Fort Worth and Texas. And so a friend of mine and I had been talking, and he suggested going back to grad school, get my MBA, would be a good idea. And so I went back to University of Texas in 01 and got my master's of business. And from there, it was really interesting. I mean, I focused, again, on investments. I always knew I wanted to do something in investments. I wasn't going to change that probably doing investment related things until I'm not here anymore. But I really had the good fortune of meeting someone that changed my life. And it was, I did an internship at Teacher Retirement System of Texas. Worked there for my last year while I was in school. And there was a gentleman there, Jim Hilly, who was the CIO. He's now the chief investment officer at TCU. And as it came to the end of my term there, and I was looking for my next role, He and I were talking, and he knew I didn't really want to work at Teacher Retirement System of Texas, didn't have really a lot of the incentives and things I wanted. But we were talking about what I could do, and he said, David, what I think you should do is go talk to Cambridge Associates. I'm like, Jim, I have no idea who Cambridge Associates is. I have no idea what Cambridge Associates does. And he told me, and I said, well, that's great, Jim, but why don't Teacher Retirement System, Texas teachers, use Cambridge? He goes, well, they're really good but they charge premium fees. We can't get the state to approve it. And it just so happened that Cambridge was on campus. Bruce Myers and Craig White, two colleagues of mine, were on campus at Texas that year because we were building out our Texas business. And they wanted people that didn't mind traveling to Texas to work with the clients. And they also had longer range plans of opening up Dallas office. So I went through the process. And at this time, the process at Cambridge Associates was... 30-something interviews. So I'm like, okay, I don't know if this interview process is going to ever end. But what I did know is I really liked what I heard. What attracted me to Cambridge Associates was really three things. A great platform to invest institutional capital for clients that were making a difference in the world. What appeared at the time to be really nice colleagues. And the third thing was no conflict. I wasn't going to have to push product, which was very important to me. And to this day, we still have no product, which is still important to me, and it's important to my colleagues. So let's circle back to you hear about Cambridge for the first time, kind of the history of Cambridge Associates as an organization, and take me through to when you joined, and then we can roll forward to what's going on today. When I joined, it was a bit of an inflection point, I think. So Cambridge started out As an advisor, as a consultant, Jim Bailey and Hunter Lewis came out of Harvard, wanted to take what they learned. They thought the endowment offices weren't really 
implementing best practices. So went out and basically formed a business to serve Harvard and the Ivy Leagues and, adv- and advise them. That was back in the mid-1970s. And so they started, the core of their business was consulting, and they grew that business over time, working with more endowments and foundations, started working with private clients. And really, the private client thing, some people think, okay, that's kind of odd to, to shift from institutions to private client. But what happened is a lot of these really wealthy individuals that had family offices were sitting on the boards of the committees of our endowments and foundations. And they said, come on, Cambridge, you're helping my institution make a difference in the world. Why don't you help me? And so we did that. And we've been working with private clients for about 40 years, then started working with pensions a little bit later in the late early and early 90s. And for the vast majority of that time, the business was traditional consulting. We'd do strategy, we'd give options, we'd, we'd partner with committees. But what happened in the late 90s and the early 2000s is people started to recognize, look, running money with four quarterly meetings and not having people like managing the portfolio daily, that's not going to work. This is too complicated. And I think the crises really highlight these things, the, the tech bubble bursting. And so our business started to morph to where people wanted to outsource the day-to-day due diligence of managers and oversight to Cambridge Associates. And that really started to take hold in the 90s, in the mid to late 90s. And by the time we got to 2005, over half of our business was outsourced. And when I say outsourced, that's either discretionary or non-discretionary, but it really doesn't change what we do doesn't change the fact that we're on the hook for the diligence, for saying what should go into the portfolio, for managing risk, for just day-to-day oversight. The only difference is non-discretionary outsourcing. There's a committee or a person who has veto power, who has the right to say, that idea, I don't think it really should go in the portfolio. Go do some more work and give us another idea, which doesn't happen very often. And what was your trajectory at Cambridge from when you started? So... From the day I started, it gave me a really global perspective. But from the day I started, I worked from clients from Geneva, Switzerland, to New York, to Texas. I worked with private clients. I worked with endowment and foundations. I worked with some of the most sophisticated family offices. So when I started, I was working on teams that were actually serving the clients. Over time, I started to see that there was a gap or a space where we could probably go out and build some business by combining What we do very well, which is manager selection, diversifying portfolios, investing across asset classes, including venture, private equity, equities, but also putting in place a risk management framework that was unique to pensions. So we had some pension business, but it wasn't a big business for us. And so I started to build that business and leadership at the time came to me around late 08, early 09 and said, David, We've never had practices. Everyone works on everything, but we'd like you to focus on the pension business. And we'd like for you to start the first practice at Cambridge. It was informal, but it was the pension practice. And they said, tell us what resources you need. Tell us what team members you need. And let's see what we can make out of that. If you flash forward to today, pensions are about 20% of our business. So we gained great traction actually in the pension community by bringing our alpha engine with a unique risk management platform that actually, you know, pertain to the pensions. So you start running this pension practice. And again, you're now working with clients yeah. as their consultant or effectively their outsourced investment engine. Today, you sit as a CEO. So what was that transition from investor to sort of the head of the business? The one point I'd come back around to on the pension thing is we focused on OCIO outsourcing. So that was where I thought we should focus the business because I thought that'd be the trend in the future, not just for ENF, but pensions. So circling around today, it's less being in the weeds of going out and finding ideas or managing portfolios. It's about thinking about the institution as a whole. So thinking about how are we going to deliver top-notch returns and top-notch service and partnership to our clients. What resources do we need? How do we need to be structured? Where are we doing well? Where can we do better? And if you think about like the metrics I look at today, it's still investment returns. And it's investment returns. I still work with a handful of clients. It's still the investment returns for those, but it's the investment returns for our clients in aggregate, understanding what's going well and what's not. And it's also partnership. So looking at our client retention, one of the things I'm proudest of is our client retention is 96, 97% invariably. 
we're doing a great job. Our average client's going to be with us 20, 25 years. And that's really meaningful to us because we want to help these clients do good in the world. We have so many great institutions that are doing great stuff or great families that are so philanthropic. So when you're serving so many different types of pools, and then we have pensions, endowments, foundations, high net worth, family offices, if you were going to go out and pitch for a new business for a new client, what's the Cambridge Associates pitch? The pitch, I would say, is, look, to generate the best returns, one, you need to diversify. You need to be equity-oriented. The second is you need to be able to go out and find managers that add value. And we know from 45 years of doing this what it takes to go out and do that. And the first is network. You have to be in the flow of ideas, and you have to be in the flow of ideas early. So that's why we have... 11 offices across the globe with 275 senior investors that are out there in the flow of ideas. You got to have elbow grease. You got to be able to do the work. The work is labor intensive. Again, that's why we have a senior team of 275 people. And the third is you got to have judgment. So that's why our team of senior people on average has 18 to 20 years experience. You take these three things and it allows us to go out and do 6,000 meetings a year across the globe, across asset classes, be early to ideas, secure better fees, secure access, and get client money in. The last thing I would say on that is, or the last two things, what allows us to succeed is the investors work with the client. So you don't get a client service rep or an investor relations rep. The senior teams work with a couple handfuls of clients and create bespoke portfolios for what the client's trying to do. And the last thing I always say is, I could still mess that up if I had conflicts in the system, which is why we don't have product. When we sit at the table with a client, with an asset owner, they know that anything we're trying to do is on their behalf. We're not trying to sell them product. The fees we make are the fees the clients pay us. We don't take any money from managers either, which is somewhat unique in our industry. So there's 275 investment professionals, 6,000 investment meetings. How does that form into a cohesive decision-making process? Right. So if you think about the investment professionals, the network's crucial because you've got to look at a lot of ideas. We think about the 10,000-plus managers that are out there. There's a few percent that actually merit any of the capital of our clients and asset owners. So what we do is... We go out and source the ideas, and then we take them through a very consistent diligence process at Cambridge Associates. And then there's groups of senior people that form committees in our firm that actually vet the ideas for quality of diligence and quality of idea. So every idea that we're putting capital in has gone through that process. Now, a lot of the ideas, because they don't merit capital, fall out of the process very early. And one of the important things of experience is pattern recognition. You can understand early in discussions whether the manager has an edge, whether they're putting the right team on the field, whether they have the right operations in place. The one thing I will say is that I'm very focused on, and if you're in a talent business, I think you have to be focused on, is making sure that our networks are as broad as possible. So one of the things we've done is we've brought in a head of diverse managers to make sure we're expanding our network, to make sure that we're seeing all the best ideas, regardless of where they come from. That's on the manager side. We're also doing it on our talent side. Again, if you're going to win, you have to have access to all the best talent, not just to some limited networks or some limited pool of talent. And so we're really pushing the envelope on making sure that our view is broad when we recruit and our view is broad when we go out and find and identify and evaluate managers. So let's take a single manager that makes it through that process. What does the process look like from the manager's perspective? I ask managers that, but managers would be, they'd be best positioned to answer the question. But what it would probably feel like to them is, you know, we sit down, one of our senior investment people sits down and has a conversation with them about what they're doing. If we find that to be attractive, enter a more formal process, will be more discussions, asking for additional information. That's on the fundamental side, you know, understanding how they invest, where their edge is, what we can expect out of the portfolio. The second part of that is operational due diligence. Do they have the right infrastructure in place? Background checks, understanding who they're partnering with as part of third party vendors. And that's kind of interesting because on our side, the fundamentals, we could think they're going in the right direction. 
But if the operational due diligence shows red flags, that's it. I mean, we'll walk away. Now, we will give the manager feedback and say, we have issues with these things. We think you ought to fix them. And if they do, we'll give them another look. But if you don't have the right infrastructure in place, we're not going to invest money with you. So on the fundamental side, investing is always this mix of art and science. And the science part, you could make consistent. You could train across all your teams. There's checklists. There's You need to get that understanding. When you have so many different experienced people that probably have their own judgment, yeah. how do you decide what bubbles up? The experienced people bring it into a dialogue, and then we have a discussion. And you can say, I think this is a good example, really, of diversity of opinion generates better outcomes, right? Having people that think about things differently or have different experiences will result in different ideas bubbling up, and it'll result in a more rigorous discussion. And then ultimately, we'll come to a decision on whether to move forward with the full manager diligence and whether to put capital with it. And how many people are involved in those with any one given manager? There could be 10 people involved in those, 10 or 15 people. And everyone, I mean, we have an open platform, so this is really a great thing. If you want to be involved in that discussion and you're on the senior member of the team, you can be involved in the discussion because we are open. We're sharing our notes real time. We're sharing our meetings real time. And again, we think that's a benefit to have more people involved rather than less. I mean, the thing you have to guard against is stuff getting stuck, right? So we work really hard to make sure that stuff doesn't get stuck from process, that it's getting pushed forward. And the senior people that oversee the committees, that's really their job, is to make sure stuff's moving forward, either moving forward and out or forward and into portfolios. And then structurally on that research side, you've got OCIO teams, I guess you still have the traditional consulting. Is there any differentiation in who's involved on the research side or does it all come together? The senior people are involved and they could be coming from the OCIO side of the shop or the consulting side or the non-discretionary portfolio management. But everyone has an equal say, everyone has equal access to the information, everyone has equal ability to deploy capital into the managers. How are you thinking about investment strategy for your clients today and how they should be positioning in these markets? The tough thing in these markets today is that we're 10 years into a bull run, 10 years into an economic expansion. You have pockets of assets that are richly valued. We think U.S. equities, sovereign debt. I mean, I just saw a figure and I can't remember what it was, but it's trillions and trillions of dollars in debt that's paying negative yield. I mean, these are not normal times or normal valuations. So the things we're thinking about is, how are we going to generate the returns that our clients need to fulfill their mission or their pension obligations or for private clients to fulfill what they're trying to achieve when you have significant pockets of the market that are overvalued? The thing I would say is, we continue to redirect more and more energy into the private parts of the market. And I'm not talking about late-stage venture or large cap buyout, which tend to be more richly valued, we're still finding a tremendous amount of interesting things to do on the venture capital side of the thing, small and middle market buyout, uh, higher returning infrastructure and real estate, and specifically in China. We're finding very interesting things to do on, on the early stage venture, both on the IT side and on the healthcare side, we're finding a lot of things to do. The last thing I would say there is, is we continue to evolve. So One of the things that I believe is you constantly have to test how you think about things and how you're operating. And you have to learn from mistakes because as an investor, you're going to make mistakes. One of the things we used to have a view on was that co-invest didn't make sense. It was pro-cyclical. You're going to do a lot of co-investment at the top of the cycle like 07. It's going to generate poor returns. It's not going to be good for institutions. Our team on the private side actually did some work and studied, were there pockets of co-invest that actually worked out well? And what they found out is that when you did co-invest with the managers we like, if you did it in their sweet spot, the sweet spot being either sector or industry expertise or size deal, that co-invest worked out very well. When you did the co-invest outside the sweet spot, you didn't generate hardly any returns. Well, all of a sudden, that allowed us to screen this huge volume of like potential co-invest we get from managers that we have longstanding relationships with, find things that are attractive. So we built a co-invest team, and we're helping our clients actually do co-invest. So again, trying to be creative and finding ways to generate excess return when you got a lot of headwinds. So on the co-invest, so that 
process is a screening process, I heard this right, to figure out which deals are the right ones to co-invest alongside your manager. The right ones to diligence. The right ones to diligence. So okay. then we'll see if there's client interest, and if there is, then we'll go through the diligence process on the deal. And do your teams re-underwrite the underlying deal? Yeah, so we get information from the manager and then underwrite the deal. Yeah. How do you assess, once you've screened for the criteria that you've understand, this is the investable universe for us, That's it's correct. the sweet spot of the manager, if your team is adding value in the underwriting among the companies in that universe? As I think about this, if we're not adding value relative to the funds that we already invested in, or we're not able to deploy more capital at higher returns and increase our allocation, then we probably shouldn't be doing this. So we have a lot of information in our database, and we'll measure ourselves. How did that deal do relative to the deals in the vintage? How did it do relative to funds and things of that nature? And when you get granular enough, so it could be that you figured out this filtering mechanism that works. And it's not an index, but you could say, hey, we're just going to co-invest in all the deals that meet the criteria of the managers we like and right. what we think is their sweet spot by size and second. And yeah, you could see like how you did versus that universe. Yeah. I mean, one of the things too is like, we'll do it, but certain clients have specific things they're trying to achieve too. So they'll put parameters around what they want to do. They create demand. If it's discretionary, we create the demand. One of the criteria is impact or MRI. And one of the things we've seen, there's always been a a group of foundations, and it's been expanding, that want their values reflected in how they invest, or at least don't want their values trampled on when they invest. And we've continued to see that group grow in the endowment and foundation side of things. What we're really seeing accelerate today is that on the private client side of things. Either when the wealth gets passed down from the wealth creators and from generation one and two to three and four, or the new wealth creators are very focused on making sure their investments, again, are consistent with their values or are having an impact on the world. And this is an area where we built out a team of 30 plus people to help work with our clients on that. And it's as big as it is in the US, it's even a bigger deal in the UK and Europe. So again, though, they're co invest they're going to look for certain things or certain industries that meet their values. When you're considering the impact portion of that mandate. How do you think about that in the context of what's generally been kind of an asset class driven asset allocation structure across the whole pool? Basically what we do, we'd go through an underwriting with the asset owner and under, help them understand the various paths you can take in implementing an impact or MRI portfolio, the trade-offs if there are any, and then we would adjust their asset allocation or how you implement that asset allocation to reflect what they're trying to achieve. And is there one way or the other that you see it more commonly? No, done? I mean, this is all over the place today. People are doing quite different things. And it ranges from just trying to avoid certain investments to actually proactively putting money into things that they think will have a positive impact on society and the world. Touch on the private markets. How are you approaching active management in just the traditional long-only equity markets? You know, it's interesting. We are still finding the ability to generate significant value add in the liquid markets, specifically the liquid equity markets. There's pockets of those markets which are harder to generate value add, but in the most part, we're still finding the ability to to find managers that actually execute very well. Are there certain types of managers you prefer, certain characteristics of those managers? It actually varies by markets. So we would tend in many cases to have a bias towards concentrated, high conviction managers. We can diversify out their idiosyncratic risk. And we've had great success in identifying those managers. But there's certain markets where kind of these 130-30, beta-1, restricted tracking error, constrained tracking error strategies work very, very well. So again, we're open to any type of strategy as long as we can understand what the drivers of value add are. And as long as we are able to continuously monitor and evaluate those managers to understand if their edge is still in place. How are you thinking about the increasing importance of quantitative techniques and artificial intelligence, even just in the long-only equity world? We have significant capital deployed with the managers that are on the cutting edge of the quantitative techniques or AI or the algorithm, the trading and investing. So 
we're very open to that. We're actually doing things inside of our shop to actually help us process information in different ways and help us understand where we might get better, either in the screening process or in the evaluation process. What's your take on hedge funds today? So it's a, <laughs> it's a loaded question because the industry at large has not fulfilled its promise. So I think we could agree to that. What I would say is hedge funds as an asset class, not worth the money. That said, there's seven, 8,000 hedge funds. We think there's 100 to 200 that actually do merit institutional capital and continue to merit institutional capital. If you don't have the confidence you can identify those or access those, I would say you shouldn't have a lot of money in hedge funds. The other thing we're really working on, too, is in our partnership with these handfuls of managers that we believe merit capital, we want a fair sharing of the alpha, meaning we think asset owners should get 65 to 75% of the alpha, at least, and that it's fine for the manager to have 20 or 30%. If the fee structures in place is not resulting in an outcome of those ratios of sharing, then we are going to work to get the right fee structure in place or we'll pass or we'll move on to something else. So we've been very proactive. I mean, fair fees and lowering fees is a good way to make sure you get some higher returns. I will say one of the things that's interesting, and we'll see how it plays out, is value investing, especially long short value investing, has been very volatile over this recent period. And it'll be interesting to see, is that a permanent shift or is it just part of the cycle like it was back in 98, 99, which was, from my recollection, very similar. When you look at that landscape and pretty common, someone will say, oh, there's 100 or 200 managers that really add value. Markets are pretty efficient. Markets for talent are pretty efficient. And then the other side is, oh, we want to have fair fees. Where does the rubber meet the road when you have the desire to access managers that likely are in demand because yeah. there's some demonstration of value add and then wanting to get a fair deal on fees? when the fee is really kind of a matching of that supply and demand? Yeah, well, I mean, fair really is fair relative to the value that can be added. If the capacity is difficult in the manager because of their ability to add significant value, then there might a higher fee structure may be justified. If it's not, then we need to move on. There is a spectrum there. Some of the best performing managers and some of the longest tenured managers that we invest with We've actually found good partnership in aligning terms and fees with them. So, you know, I think the good partners and the good managers in the world want to be good partners to the asset owners as well. And one thing we don't hear as much about anymore when people are more focused on fees is is the degree of transparency or opacity in some of these strategies. And where are we today and where are we moving? The bottom line is we require transparency so we can understand what's driving returns how the returns are being generated, is it alpha or beta? So if it's ill-transparent, we just don't go down the path of investing. Now, we probably missed some good managers in that case, but that's just kind of one of our foundational beliefs and tenets when we invest capital for clients. And then what degrees of depth does that mean? Because some of the stuff you talked about is sort of structural as opposed to kind of position-level transparency. The managers give performance attribution. So we get attribution from all of our managers. What were the big return drivers relative and relative and contributors? Some of the strategies are more structural. So clearly, no one's going to give us an algorithm, if you will, but they'll help us understand what type of inefficiencies they're trying to isolate, what type of process they have to do that, what type of process they have to refresh the algorithms or bring new models into place to generate the returns on the fundamental strategies, I mean, we get the book. How are you thinking about fixed income markets? You would think that fixed income, well, if you're asking about valuation, fixed income is rich, spreads are a little bit tight. You have to be in some of the more complex instruments to actually find, I think, interesting risk return opportunities. On the value add side for managers, we still find the ability to add managers to add value in high quality fixed income. That said, on our endowment and foundation clients, our private clients, they're not doing a lot of treasuries or corporate credit. It's more on the pension side for some of the de-risking strategies. Yeah. But we're thinking about the same way. Valuation-based, what role does it play in the portfolio? Can it be a hedge against deflation or recession? And then can you add any value through manager selection? You talked earlier about the importance of innovation. Where are you trying to innovate on the investment process? The things we're constantly doing, and one thing... 
I believe in is to evaluate how you make decisions and how you bring people to the table. And it's not like AI or it's not like big data, which we have a lot of big data and we're constantly looking through that data to find edges and help us understand where managers can add value. But one of the things we've worked at is making sure that we understand the biases that are in decision-making processes, understand how to create an environment where we can hold each other accountable for our biases. And, you know, Daniel Kahneman, who really is one of my intellectual idols, and Kahneman and Tversky, I think, were just brilliant, brilliant people. He makes a case often that by understanding we have biases, we can hold ourselves accountable, but that only gets you a little bit of the way there. You have to create an environment where you can hold each other accountable because you're going to have a lot better shot at seeing my biases or helping me see my biases than I am on my own. And just on that front, I mean... I think the work that is so powerful in grad school, we didn't have a class on behavioral finance. So I went to the head of the department and said, hey, I think this is missing. Let me design my own class and spend a semester uh, as a class studying Kahneman and Tversky's work. And then I'll come back to you and help you understand how you can, how the student run investment fund can put in place processes and decision making bodies that'll work better in proposed criteria for you to use moving in the future. But I just think that's crucially important because 30 years ago, data was scarce. And I remember when I got in the business, sometimes you'd have stuff overnighted to get information quicker. I'm swimming in information. Our team's swimming in information now. It's not so much what information you get. It's how you synthesize that information and how you make decisions that's the edge today. So I just think understanding these dynamics and how the human mind work is really important. You head off the conversation talking about how passionate you are about competing. Yeah. How do you think about Cambridge's business through the lens of competition? It is really interesting. So on the endowment and foundation side, as I think probably most of our listeners know today, we have significant market share. In most cases, we're 50, 60 percent of the market. And the competitors we have there tend to be boutiques, tends to be the large pension shops that are trying to come in and build some endowment and foundation business. So a Mercer, Aon, Towers, or it's the CIOs that have spun out of the endowment or foundation offices and started their OCIO shops. There's your competition there. On the pension side, it truly is the big three and a few others. It's Aon, Towers, and Mercer. All these shops have their qualities and their good points. And then private client side is just very fragmented. No one has more than 2% of the market. It's boutiques, it's multifamily offices, it's banks. So it's really interesting that our business, the competition is really different everywhere. And what I've described is basically the U.S. and Western Europe. If you go to Asia, the competitors kind of change a little bit as you get over there too. So very, very different. As you look out over the next five or 10 years, what do you think are the next steps for Cambridge Associates? we're constantly going to be focused on making sure we have the right talent in place to generate great returns for our clients and to be great partners. So five, 10 years, that's not going to change. What I think will change is that our footprint in Asia will expand for multiple points. One, because there's just a lot of interesting investment ideas over there and we already have a good team over there, but that should continue to expand as we continue to look for great ideas specifically in China, venture and growth equity. But also, I think our business will expand in Asia. What's going on in the private wealth market in China today is that the entrepreneurs or the business owners are starting to think about what happens as they age or as the next generation comes into play. They're looking west. They're coming and visiting family offices in Western Europe, the U.S., and those family offices are saying, this is how we're structured you should go talk to Cambridge Associates too. So our business is really gaining some traction there as the private clients become more institutional, if you will, and start to put in place the infrastructure. We've had this long period of time where, certainly in the public markets, Vanguard's growing like crazy. There's a big move to passive investing. And it's been hard to keep up, right? Hard to keep up with the S&P, hard to keep up with the 60-40 over the last 10 years. How do you think about that sort of existential question of, is all this effort worth it? Well, first, I think the question would be answered two ways. In aggregate of all the people going through the effort, is it worth it? No, because we know that after fees in aggregate, 
it's going to be a negative return relative to the index, if you will. That said, that doesn't mean it's illogical for us to actually go after this if we can actually generate extra returns for our clients. And how I think about this, the move to Vanguard or ETFs or passive could totally be rational for the majority of institutions or asset owners that are doing it. And it could still be rational for us not to do it with our clients if we're generating significant value add. So my job and the job of my team is to continue to evaluate whether we are and whether we think we can do so in the future. We are, and we do believe we can continue to do so in the future. In some ways, it may provide us even additional opportunity if you have less people actually pursuing active management. It could make the markets a little less efficient, if you will. What do you see as your biggest challenges as an organization? I mean, the challenges of the organization are talent. We need to find and retain the best talent. We need to have the broadest net cast for that talent. We need to make sure we're stretching and pushing outside of our networks. If we have the best talent and we keep our infrastructure in place and avoid conflict, I feel very good that we'll be able to generate great returns and be great partners to clients. But it really does come down to talent. And what are you most excited about in the business? The thing I'm most excited about in the business is we make a difference in the world. We work with great clients who are doing medical research or actually funding scholarships or paying pensions. And, you know, when I came to Cambridge, again, I go back to that. I told you how I ended up at Cambridge and what was attractive. So we get to make a difference in the world. We have a great investment platform. We have good colleagues. We're without conflict. And we recently did an internal study to see what makes Cambridge an attractive place to work, other than just, you know, compensation packages and things like that, which are important. And... It came back very strong on get to work with clients that are doing something really special in the world, great colleagues and unconflicted. So the making a difference in the world is great. Also, again, I'm competitive. The fact that we're able to work with clients and generate significant value add kind of fulfills that part of me. But it's really great that we get to do it with institutions and asset owners that are doing good stuff in the world. Great. Well, David, let's leave some time for some closing questions. Yeah, sure. (laughs) What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Yoga and meditation. I found that that ability to generate space to reflect actually makes my life much more enjoyable in how I interact with people on a day-to-day basis. And it creates the space to actually be able to, going back to Kahneman, think slow so that you can think about things strategically and in complex layers rather than just really tactical, fast thinking. And what's your practice? It's vinyasa, breath work, and yin, actually. So Every day? Almost every day. I practice almost every day around the world. Unless I'm on an all-night flight and go straight into work, I usually practice. What's your biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve is when people assume they know someone's intent or they assume malintent. I believe I can't know your intent and you can't know my intent and we should give people the benefit of the doubt. I think it's destructive when we assume intent. How about your biggest investment pet peeve? My biggest investment pet peeve is when people lack humility. We're going to make investment mistakes. We should be humble about it. We should learn from it and use those mistakes to actually become better investors. We should also be humble about what we don't know so that when we put together portfolios that we're taking risk that's reasonable within the parameters, acknowledging that there are always things we can't know. What's your favorite book? Well, it's Kahneman. It's the book. You know, I read his essays with Tversky, which was a big book of essays, but I think Thinking Fast and Slow, the book, was just a fantastic book because it digested it down into something that a large number of people in our country and in society could actually digest and have time to read. I thought it was fantastic. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? For my mom, I learned work ethic. She was a project manager in a hospital on an IT team. And they were rolling up hospitals. And when they rolled them up, they'd do these conversions. And the team would stay up all night for days on end. She did that until she was mid-70s, retired. And they came back to her a couple years later and said, 
we want you to come back. I mean, that is work ethic. For my dad, it's graciousness and kindness. He practiced it every day and set an example for me. And I think kindness and graciousness are some of the most important things that we could all bring into society and treat each other with. Okay, all right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you learned a lot earlier in your life? How to deal with stress. I wish I'd known that from going back to teenage years, but it's really interesting, you know, and it's really, I think about it in the form of yoga and meditation and breath work, but once you learn how to deal with stress, it actually creates a much different life and it allows you to interact with people differently. Yeah, you mentioned yoga, breath work. Are there other tools that you've come up with that help? Oh, exercise, being present when you're with friends and family, you know, just being really mindful and conscious about what you're doing and where you are. Okay. David, thanks so much. Hey, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show and I thank you for it. Have a good one and see you next time. 